Um, I'm going to moderate this this morning with our candidates, and this is our, I think, fourth um, meet the candidates for coffee with coffee on a Friday morning here at headquarters. We're going to continue to do this up through the primary until we've been able to uh, review all of the candidates who are invited and come in and talk to us. So uh, our candidates today are Mike Levine and Addie Owens, and um, they are running for the Florida House of Representatives District what? 26. 26. 26. And uh, Diane, would you show everybody on the map where 26 is so y'all know if you get to vote for it or not? This is 26. And what towns does that include? That includes Tiberi's, Fruitland Park, Leesburg, Mount Dora, Eustis. Oh, wait a minute, 13 goes up that way. That's a Senate <laughs> district. So you'll need, if you're questioning, come over and look at the map so that you can be, because the um, voting precincts and things have changed. Right. Take a right, right, right. Okay. Question. Does that extend into any other county? No. It's only North Lake. Only North Lake. Okay. okay. You guys get together more. You have to get away from the picture. All right. Oh, is that what you're trying to do? <laughs> no, stand close together. Well, oh, yeah. We, we can't get you with the window. We do. You've got to get mine to move over a little bit to the right. To the right. A little bit to the right. Yeah. 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 That's, That's it. There we go. See the picture? Are they putting Trump's That's what we're doing. Okay, that's up. He approves of this election. Good. <laughs> okay, you're good. You're good. Good morning. Okay. <laughs> that's the ritual everybody has to go through. <laughs> Sorry, guys. The next president and us. <laughs> yes, exactly. That's right. Uh, well, I'm a firm believer in ladies first. So uh, if you both want to have a seat or if you want to stand while you talk, it's up to you. But um, let me move this out of the way because we're not going to have a candidate here, I do not think. And you can use that seat. Um, so, Annie, if you want to start, uh, start with a presentation of about three to four minutes, and then we'll have Mike do the same, and then we will ask you questions, and you can both answer the questions, okay? okay. Um, people on the chairs, you have a three by five card. Um, write your questions out so old people like me can read them. And um, both questions will have an opportunity to answer, and no gotcha questions. We're going to do this politely, like Republicans should, right? Okay. All right. Go ahead, Eddie. It's all yours. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm Addie Owens, obviously. I've um, been here in the Mount Dora. I used to send to various areas since 1999. I've raised my kids here. They're now grown and gone. They're, my daughter's in Colorado. My son is in active duty Navy at this point. Um, he, was, he just finished his four years. He's got three years left in active. And there in Georgia, he's working for Gulfstream. So he was able to take his transferable skills and put them to work. And my grandson and my uh, daughter-in-law are up there in, uh, it's called a little town called Ellabel, outside of Savannah. So that's where I'm at as far as the parenting stage. It's really enjoyable to, uh, to enjoy the season of being an empty nester. Um, professionally, I've been in the real estate business for going on 20 years now. My office is in downtown Mount Dora. I own a real estate brokerage. I am the broker owner of that. I also own a real estate school, and I spend a tremendous amount of my time professionally teaching other realtors across the country and locally how to build their businesses and be better realtors for the community. So that's where I'm at professionally. Now, politically, why have I jumped into this race? <laughs> Well, obviously, uh, our, our nation is in a very precarious time, and we need good leaders to get things done. Um, on a national level, we've got to fight for everything that we have, with everything that we have to save this country, uh, because it is, it is in peril. Locally, we're so blessed to be in the state of Florida. Governor DeSantis has done an excellent job. He did an excellent job navigating us through COVID when many of our rights were threatened, if not taken away. And while I agree with some of most of his policies, there are obviously some that I also disagree with, um, as any leaders would feel the same. From the state perspective, immigration is a massive problem. Uh, we do have vessels on their way, uh, Florida bound, and local elections matter when it comes to um, immigration. We've got to have a strong response legislatively and with the governor to have a plan of action to not have these illegal immigrants, and they are illegal aliens, coming into our communities and depleting our resources that we've seen, you know, when they were bused to blue states, you know, as basically retribution for allowing that, that border to be open. When they're bused here, when they settle here, they're going to deplete the same resources. And we've got to have a plan of action to fight against that. We cannot allow that. 
um, and that's why I'm part of why I'm running to uh, go up there and go toe to toe with some of these policies or enforce some of these policies to get through because we've got to protect our communities in a very strong way. So, very good. With that, I'll let Mike have the floor and I'll come over here. Are you guys ready? Understand? You ready for that? I'm ready. Okay, great. Well, thanks everybody for coming out this morning. Uh, my name is Mike Levine and I'm running for the Florida House in District 26. And um, I just, you know, um, I had a conversation with my family and uh, we talked about the uh, serious nature that our country is in and of course the impact that it has on, our, on the state of Florida. So I'm a grandfather of three. Uh, my kids are up in Panama City, Florida. And uh, we just had a conversation about that and uh, my family thought it was a good idea for me to run for this seat. Uh, you know, I was the chairman of this party <clears throat> between 2012 and 2016. And um, we uh, still, uh, to this day, struggle to get the Republican Party of Florida to listen to what the constituents um, are concerned about. So what we really have, <clears throat> you know, is an administrative state in working closely with special interests and um, just like this past legislative session uh, exemplified that the concerns of the people are pretty secondary uh, to what's going on in the legislature even here in the state of Florida. Um, when I was the chairman of the party between 2012 and 2016, I thought that it was my job uh, to be the liaison between the con Republican constituents in Lake County and the Republican Party of Florida. So with the delegation uh, from Lake County, which would be the chairman, which was me, and the state committee man and the state committee woman, we walked into those Republican Party of Florida meetings with an agenda every quarter. And the Republican Party of Florida was pretty quick to tell us that they really, they told us from the podium in front of the entire delegation of the Republican Party of Florida, they really weren't concerned about what we thought about public policy. Our job as the local Republican Executive Committee was to give the Republicans that they gave us elected. And, th and that was about it, right? So um, by being involved in politics for the length of time that I have, which has been a very long time, uh, Addie and I are both realtors, and the Realtor Association is extraordinarily um, political, right? They have a big lobby, and they're one of the most powerful, certainly one of the most powerful lobbying organizations in the state and um, in the country, and I served on their board of directors for 12 years, and I was the president of the Osceola County Association of Realtors in 1999, and the, chair, the president of the Central Florida Commercial Association in 2008, and, uh, in, and again, uh, get, you know, contributing a lot of my time and money uh, to the Realtor Association, which is a very political organization. Um, so it just gives me a lot of background in the politics of it all you know, moving from the Realtor Association over to the Republican Executive Committee here in Lake County when I moved into Lake County uh, in 2005 and then getting involved with the Republican Executive Committee in 2010. And it's just extraordinarily important that the voice of the people is heard. And I really believe that the voice of the people is pretty insignificant to the people who are legislating in Tallahassee. And, uh, you know, uh, pres uh, Senate President Kathleen Pasadomo's immediate reaction to the Republican Party of Florida's publishing of their legislative priorities for 2024, for those of you who don't know, as soon as Kathleen Pasadomo received the legislative priorities of the Republican Party of Florida, not the Lake County Republican Executive Committee, but the Republican Party of Florida, the first thing she did was run over to the Tallahassee Democrat and let them know that no anti-woke legislation was going to come to the floor and no election reform bills were going to come to the floor. Well, this is what Republicans in Florida want. So how can you have a Republican president of the Florida Senate immediately running over to the liberal press in Tallahassee stating that the voice of the people, in the Republicans in Florida, is not coming to the floor, even though we have Republican legislature, legislators filing bills on the floor? That is what we're facing. So what we have to understand is that in Florida, there's three people who determine what happens and what doesn't happen. Obviously, the governor has to sign legislation into law after it's cleared through the Florida House and the Florida Senate, and the Speaker of the House and the President of the Senate decide what comes to the floor and what doesn't. So a lot of times when you see your legislator, and I, I just give this, uh, the Republican Executive Committee uh, here in Lake County, a lot of credit, because we have been the driver behind bringing the voice of the people to the legislature. And uh, after years and years and years of diligent advocacy in this particular legislative session in 2024, we got a lot of great legislation, not everything we wanted, but a lot of great legislation 
was filed and heard in committee, and then your leadership is saying it's not coming to the floor. Well, why are we putting it through committee meetings if it's not coming to the floor? So this is a bit of a dog and pony show, right? Where in order to appease our constituents, um, our Republican um, legislators will file legislation knowing that it's really not going to come to the floor. So that's what you got in the 2044 legislative session. So this, again, um, I don't want to overstretch my time uh, okay. on my we open. Shut you down yet. Okay, Sorry. great. Let me know. Let me know <laughs> when it's time. Um, but um, certainly, and I hope we have a chance today to talk about the impact of illegal immigration on our state because it's so much deeper than the conversation that we're having now. And then, of course, um, we've all been concerned about election integrity, particularly here in Lake County since 2020. If you remember the REC meeting in January of 2021 when the Republican National Committee sent their representative to the <laughs> Lake County Republican Party, and that meeting was, <laughs> was a circus, right? Because the Republican Party just really wasn't interested in doing much to change the way our elections are run. And um, I believe that the elections need reform, that the election system needs reform. So we're also facing this uh, critical, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion, critical race theory, transgenderism, not only in our school, but in our culture. So I think we have some cultural work to do to get the state of Florida and the United States of America back onto a Judeo-Christian footing on which the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of this great country were written. So I'm an advocate for Judeo-Christian values um, as a culture in America, okay, in keeping with the Constitution of the United States, of course. That's a good point, a good place to stop. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Perfect. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Are you ready for questions? Sure. All right. Um, and we'll start with you this time, Mike. Okay. Uh, what will you commit to for Florida legislation, and what legislation will you introduce for election integrity? Um, Stand up to talk, okay, would you perfect. mind? Yes. Okay, okay. thanks. So, uh, basically, uh, there's a two-fold question there. You know, what yes, legislation would I introduce? <laughs> And the second uh, is about election integrity. So, you know, this is a pretty big deal. Um, you know, Addie and I are both uh, realtors. So we saw the Live Local Act, <clears throat> which was passed, which was amazing to me, to be honest. Uh, the Live Local Act uh, is a 95-page bill, obviously cross-referencing a lot of other legislation, you know, that regulates the way that particular act is um, administer. Um, so when you study that bill, what it really does, it urbanizes the state of Florida, is what it does. So the bill, um, the bill stipulates that when we have um, industrial and commercial zone properties, um, then those properties are automatically approved for certain uh, affordable, housing comp uh, affordable housing developments to be included without a land use change or a zoning change. Um, the legislation also circumvents the city council and the county commissioners because uh, the, county com the city councils and the county commissioners would typically decide how much affordable housing we get in our municipalities and how much affordable housing we get in our counties and then they would decide on where that affordable housing should go. But the Live Local Act circumvents the city council and the county commissioners from their input on those decisions. So when they get certain applications that meet certain qualifications, those applications are immediately approved. Well, the people in District 26 uh, don't want uh, multifamily affordable housing complexes in their backyard. And uh, this really circumvents it. For example, um, if somebody lives someplace and there is an affordable housing complex that is, you know, filed an application, uh, which there is no longer a need for land use change at all, right? But uh, typically what would happen is if you were opposed to a change to a, an amendment to a land use, whether it's in the city or in the county, you would have an opportunity to go speak to your city council members and you'd have an opportunity to go speak to your county commissioners and make your case about why you're either for or against that particular land use change. Well, the, today the city council members and the county commissioners are going to look at the, <clears throat> at the citizen who's either for or against, speaking for or against this land use change, and they're going to say, hey, we have nothing, we have no voice in this. This is automatically approved by the state of Florida, and I'm against that, okay? Um, uh, I've been out talking to a lot of voters, and I haven't found a single voter who wants to carte blanche increase density 
in District 26. Not a single voter. So this is highly, un um, highly unfavorable uh, to the people who live here. So I'd like to start by just repealing the Live Local Act. Okay, in its entirety. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Point number one, and point number two is on election integrity. Um, you know, it's so interesting because something that has that is really so simple has become really complicated uh, because of the um, uh, because of the voting machines. So the simple answer is to have paper ballots voted in the precincts, counted in the precincts, right, and no machines in our elections. It's very doable. The election integrity people have proven that counting the ballots in the precincts is very doable and timely. So we need to get rid of the voting machines and do paper ballots counted in the precincts. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Okay, Eddie, I'll ask questions again. What will you commit to for Florida legislation, and what legislation will you introduce for election integrity? What will I commit to in Florida re uh, regulation? Can you move, move over a little bit? He's blocking your view. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no tall guys He's in the front row. Nice <laughs> hey, me and John is okay. Yeah, Coming in late. <laughs> there you go. Now we're better. All right. There we go. Okay. So, what would I commit to legislatively? Uh, number one, we have an insurance problem. That's my biggest concern right now. It does not matter. Now, the Live Local Act is a different conversation because there's a lot of really good things in the Live Local Act. There is some overstep on our government on the Live Local Act, and you know that needs to be addressed. But the Live Local Act, in its fundamental principle, is good. Um, and that's, we've, we funded $100 million in down payment assistance for buyers. How many of you have looked at buying a house recently? Anybody? Um, Try to afford one right now with yeah. interest rates at 7% and people living paycheck to paycheck. They'll pay more in rent than they would on a mortgage. And trying to come up with that down payment is almost impossible. Many of us have kids and grandkids that you would like to see build wealth. The Live Local Act actually helps them do that. Can we dial it back a bit? Sure, we can dial it back a bit. I, I don't disagree with that. As far as legislation is concerned, we have an insurance problem, and that's a major issue. Yes, the legislator has been legislation has uh, taken some effort to combat some of that um, bad policy that we've had for a while. We've got to keep that competitive landscape here in Florida. But I'm a big believer in transparency. Why don't we have a consumer rating on insurance companies? You all have the right to pick your own insurance company, but you don't find out if they're terrible until it's too late. Mm -hmm. When you file the claim and they just abruptly deny it, they didn't even send anybody out to your house, they just said, no, that's a breach of contract. So why not come up with a consumer rating system that forces them to put on the front page of their policy what rate they are? Speaking of policies, as a buyer, when you bind your insurance, Find your insurance, I bought a house, day of closing, they're going to tell you how much your insurance is, and 30 days later, you're going to get the contract delivered to you. Mm -hmm. You don't even have an opportunity to read it before you select this insurance company. Mm -hmm. They just tell you how much it is. And then it's kind of too late. You can go shop for new insurance and get your money back eventually, but you still have to go buy a new policy and pay for that. So why not put that transparency up front to say, this company, this is your policy that we're proposing, and this is their consumer rate, and base that rating on the amount of claims filed, the amount of claims paid, the amount of uh, the amount of policies held in or uh, are written underneath their company, what their financial, we have a, a FSR rating for the state, so that's financial stability rating, and once it drops below a certain point, the state takes conservatorship of it. So they take it over. But at what point do you as a consumer know when that's happening? That's got to be repealed. We need legislation that puts transparency right in the face of the consumer that's using it. The legislation you'd introduce for election integrity? Serial numbers. Every single bill, piece of money, has a serial number. Mm -hmm. You have a social security number. We all have IDs. These <coughs> ballots should have serial numbers. Mm -hmm. And it's attached to you as a person. Mm -hmm. So there can only be one vote cast. Okay. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> awesome. Okay. Next question. Uh, what is your track record for supporting and implementing any type of government reforms is what you have received versus what you have, sorry, what you have, have achieved versus talking about an issue. What? Okay. I'm confused. <laughs> what is your track record for supporting and implementing any type of government reforms? 
what you have achieved versus talking about an issue. In other words, explain what you've achieved versus you've just been talking about it and agreeing with the issue. Okay. I think Annie goes first. Yep, Annie goes first. Yep, yes. yep. yep. Annie, you're first. Uh, so, as, as Mike mentioned, we're both realtors and we're both part of the Realtor Party. So we have the Real, Realtors Political Action Committee. We're the largest uh, trade association in the United States and we by far are the largest, I would say, we argue. We're the largest lobbyist in the state of Florida. There's no question about that. So for the past 10 years, we've been advocating on the, for the consumer. The Realtor Organization was started to advocate for the consumer and we have been doing that. I've spent thousands upon thousands of dollars investing in candidates to get policy pushed through for the benefit of the consumers in our communities. So our track record of success, I will attach myself to that because we spend so much time lobbying our legislators uh, for policies that will help the consumer from insurance reform, condo reform, and dialing back some of that condo reform. I mean, when the Surfside collapsed, they made a blanket law that required or, or disabled the ability to uh, pass on your reserves. So if you have a condo, you're supposed to have 10% of repair costs in reserves. And for the last you know, 30 years, people have been waving that, oh, we don't want to do that this year. Oh, we don't want to do that this year. So the condo reform, the 1.0 bill that was passed in 2023, basically said, blanket, everybody has to have 10% in reserves. We don't care who you are, where you're at, you have to have it, no matter what the condition of the building is in. So that put um, a special assessment uh, burden on the property owners within those condo units. I know that doesn't sound like it really affects us because we don't have a lot of condos here. We do have some, but across the state it was a, a, a blanket blanket problem uh, forcing people to sell their, their condos. And that's their homes, that's their livelihoods, and we're talking about $150,000 a pop due mm -hmm. within a year. Mm -hmm. So people were losing their condos, investors were coming in and buying it and be like, oh, okay, we'll pay it, we'll be done, and then we'll rent it out. And that's not fair to the consumer. So this year we pushed for Condo 2.0 that said, wait a second, we have, to, we have to level this out. Not everybody needs the same assessment requirement right now. Let's, let's pull it, dial it back, let's give them a couple of years to catch up on the reserves if the property is in livable condition. Surfside was an absolute preventable tragedy. And the legislation that we enacted, that we helped enact, absolutely helped the safety of the residents in those condominiums, but we shouldn't burden them on the back end either. So mm -hmm. we did achieve that this year. That's, That's good. good. Thank you. Awesome. Very good. Okay. Very good. Whoa. Uh -huh. Very good. Okay. You ready for me? Okay, very good. Great. Right. Uh, you repeat the question or no? Yeah, please. Okay. Uh, what is your track record for supporting and implementing any type of government reform? Um, and what have you achieved uh, versus talking about an issue? Okay. Uh, well, um, uh, first of all, I'd like to start off by saying uh, that when I was the chairman of this party, um, one of our members uh, stood up in a Republican Executive Committee meeting, and uh, Governor Rick Scott was the governor at the particular time, and he said that he thought that the, many of you were possibly there. Uh, uh, he thought that we should uh, write a letter to the governor uh, because the governor was, he let it be known to the legislature that under certain circumstances he would expand Medicaid in the state of Florida. Well, the Republican Executive Committee was totally against expanding Medicaid in the state of Florida. The federal government was baiting us into it, right? They said they would uh, cover the 100% of the cost of expanding Medicaid in Florida for a certain amount of time, and then they would gradually dial it back and to the point that eventually the state of Florida is going to have to foot the entire bill of this huge Medicaid expansion. So um, the body asked me to write a letter to the governor and let him know that the Republican Executive Committee was against expanding Medicaid in Florida. I wrote the letter. Um, and, you know, in typical style, the letter was pretty direct uh, to the governor, explaining to him in detail why the members of the Lake County Republican Executive Committee were opposed to expanding Medicaid in Florida. And eventually, Medicaid was not expanded in Florida. And I think that's a lot to do um, with the advocacy that we do right here at the Republican <coughs> Executive Committee. And this is the reason why the Republican Party of Florida and all of our um, local Republican Executive Committees must, in my view, be incubators for public policy because 
you know, we are engaged citizens, or we wouldn't be members of the Republican Executive Committee, and many of the other civic organizations um, that do the same kind of work, right, in various different specialties. So that is just an example of one thing that I was asked to spearhead on behalf of the uh, Lake County Republican Executive Committee that was successful. Now, of course, I don't take credit for doing that all by myself, obviously. Uh, Governor Scott had a lot of input on the expansion of Medicaid. And then, um, just to give you another example, um, in 2008, when we had a recession, uh, the sheriff here in Lake County was asking for a significant increase to his budget. And the members of the Republican Executive Committee were against uh, giving the sheriff um, more money for his budget because we were in a recession. So effectively, and I'm not you know, picking on the sheriff, but we did uh, stand against that in the Board of County. I personally um, stood against the expansion, the uh, additional funds for the sheriff in that particular situation because when you raise taxes on citizens in a recession, um, it creates bankruptcies. And we, you could go on and on about, you know, when you, again, just the fundamental premise which is huge. I mean, this is a huge piece of this particular election that we're talking about right now. Because uh, actually, I'll, I'll exemplify it by saying that uh, I talked to Sean Parks when he was running for uh, the Board of County Commissioners in 2010. And I explained to Sean Parks, I'm a businessman, so it's my job to make my business big and profitable. It's your job to keep the government small and lean. Okay, and that's a, that's a, that's a conversation that we just have lost over the years. So I've had many situations like that where I've advocated for things that did come to pass. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you have to answer that one. Yeah. All right. Okay. All right. So Mike, you're going to stay out here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. We take turns. All right. Here's the question: Our state is facing several pressing problems that threaten the continuing growth of our economy. Among them, the skyrocketing cost of property insurance and the overtaxing of our infrastructure by unbridled development. What specific plans do you have to address these two problems? Wow. How many minutes do I have? Three. Three minutes? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying to you, and I, um, you know, I, um, we are dealing with globalization. The, 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 the big problem we're facing in America and in Florida is globalization, okay? So when you get into this, um, this is exactly what we're talking about. So, uh, I don't know, 20 years ago, um, I served on a smart growth. There was a statewide smart growth council. And what they wanted to do, uh, their, their, their vision was to do all of the development inside of development zones. Okay? And um, they, they would connect these high-density development zones with mass transportation, you know, high-speed rail or whatever the case might be. Right? Which is the total urbanization of our state and America. Okay, so um, when we're talking, the again, I go back to the Live Local Act because that's exactly what this is, right? I mean, basically, you're local, and again, it circumvents your city council and your county commissioners from having a voice in where multifamily uh, development goes, and of course, the rooftops and the multifamily development affects everything: roads, water, sewer, everything, congestion, all of that kind of stuff, right? So that's a huge problem uh, that Flor I think Floridians don't want, okay? Floridians really don't, we're not um, flocking into urban areas, you know, ditching our suburban homes to move to uh, uh, high-density multifamily apartment complexes in downtown Orlando or something like that, right? So that's a huge uh, problem that we have. And um, so what specific so then, problems do you have? To okay, address? so so here's the, here's the next step that most people don't really understand or haven't thought about, right? So Pew Research came out and said there's 775,000 illegal immigrants in Florida. Okay, I've been doing real estate around Disney, right? I mean, so I I see this uh, up front and close and personal all the time. And uh, where do the 775,000 people live? Right, they're absorbing housing, right? So the real estate market would be completely different if we didn't have 775,000 illegals living in the state of Florida, right? Mm -hmm. So in addition to providing the down payment assistance that Addie referred to um, for home buyers, um, we're also, with your taxpayer dollars, we're funding down payment assistance in an undersupplied market, okay, driving the price of housing, which is the problem we're trying to solve, right? So when we have an undersupplied market and we subsidize housing purchases, it drives demand for housing, 
And when you have, drive demand for housing in an undersupplied market, the price goes up. And you're paying for that with your tax dollars. At the same time, we're also subsidizing the construction of multifamily apartment buildings in your backyard with your money that you don't want, right? So this is a, a big problem uh, that we really have to look at because what happens when legislation gets filed, um, you know, there's benefits to certain groups, okay, that makes the rest of the bad bill it look sweet. It's like a sugar stick, okay, to get this done. And I'd like, I'm sure I'll we'll talk more about that in another question. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I'll read it again, Eddie. Thank you. Our state is facing several pressing problems that threaten and continue the continuing growth of our economy. Among them, the skyrocketing cost of property insurance and the overtaxing of our infrastructure by unbridled development. What specific plans do you have to address these two problems? So let's start with the housing supply, because that goes back to affordability. So whether you want to upsize or downsize, we have to be able to do that in, in a healthy real estate market. Everything that we do, everything revolves around where we live and where we work, right? It affects you. We are 7 million units short in the United States in housing. Because of the recession, there was this choke point with developers that they stopped building for a very long time, but the population kept growing. So now that the, the market has really recovered, the builders are really um, guarded in, in how they're establishing communities. So we have to, I know, I, you would think, but if you look it at It doesn't the, look like it here. It doesn't <laughs> look like it here. Lake County has grown 22% since 2018. Part of that was due to that toll road that came in, but that's been in the works for 30 years. The only thing that slowed it down was the recession. So that was going to come whether we stomped our feet and you know and, and threw ourselves on a road or not. It was coming. And all with all of that is the development, the Wolf Branch Innovation District that's been on the books for 25 years. So it's in the, that, that corridor is now built. The state of Florida is a healthy place to live and work, especially economically, and that's what attracts people here. It's not just the sunshine, it's that you can actually provide for your family here, and we need to keep it that way. But if we're a million, 1.5 million units of housing short just in the state of Florida alone. So if we want our kids and our grandkids to be able to buy a house because home ownership is absolutely under attack, it's under attack from all sorts of outside forces. We want our kids to be able to buy a house because that is the number one way they will be able to build wealth in their lives. That's the number one way. It's almost like a forced savings account. Mm -hmm. You put it aside, You on, on an average you'll gain between 6 and 8% a year just in equity on a normal market. In the last five years we were averaging 16 to 23% a year just in equity. Right. Somebody wants to take that away from you. We do need more development, but we need to be smart about it. We can't just throw a thousand houses in a, a tiny little space and not address the roads and the schools and everything else aside. But I want my kids to be able to come back to the state of Florida and afford to buy a house. Or do we need to send them off into a more depressed area where their opportunities for earning income are superior or quite inferior than what they are here in the state of Florida? How do we balance that? Nobody wants growth. Everybody wants to close the door behind them wherever they go. That's not realistic. We're not dealing with reality. But if we can take more smart, strategic approaches to the developments that we allow, I think that's the solution. Roads, schools, hospitals, and public safety all have to be addressed with every single development that's allowed to come into a community. It can no longer be ignored, especially in North Lake County. Thank you. Um, let's see. Okay. Next question. This is a three-part question, but I think you can answer it pretty, pretty briefly. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I got the bill, so I said. Okay. First part. What is the root cause of inflation in Florida uh, and the country? What can be done to cover the to lower the cost of living in Florida? And the third question is a bib biblical worldview positive or negative goal of governmental leadership? The first one is, what is the root cause of inflation in Florida and the country? We start with that. Oh, well, that would be That's the federal government. <laughs> yeah, yes. That's three questions. We're going to start there. The root cause of inflation is the federal government printing money like it's somebody else's. Oh, it is. It's, it's ours. And then they give us a little, tax us so we can spend it, and then they send it overseas. That's right. It's got to stop. I mean, this is not a sustainable business model. 
if it were any of our businesses, we'd already be in bankruptcy court. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it's not sustainable. Right. In Florida, we're just we're just like the sunshine. Well, that's. <laughs> um, and it said, what can be done to lower the cost of living in Florida? Lower the cost of living. Well, in we've got Florida. to. In Florida, we've got to keep our federal government in check. But lower the cost of living, and we have to drive home that insurance problem. The insurance, 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 and insurance. You know, uh, our property values increased, like we talked about in the last question, on average between 18 and 23 percent in the last five years. Well, those property taxes didn't decrease. You're capped at three percent if you've got a homestead and property. But you know, the, the governments, the local governments, and state state governments benefited from that real estate boom here. To have a $15 billion surplus in the Florida state budget, that's significant. Mm -hmm. That sounds like overtaxing to me. Yeah. Um, is a biblical worldview a positive or negative goal of governmental leadership? Government, <laughs> you're supposed to serve people, not special interests, not some big corporation. My job when I go up to Tallahassee is to serve you. I cannot stand when we get legislators that are elected into these seats, they get up to Tallahassee, they shut the door behind them, and they don't answer your call until mm -hmm. the election is here. That's right. And now they've got to pay attention to you. you know, my phone number is all over the internet. I, I live in Tiberias. I welcome your calls. I welcome meetings. And when I go up to Tallahassee, my door will be open to you. We might have to fit it into a tight schedule. That's fine. But my door will always be open to you. That didn't answer the question. A biblical service. worldview, a positive or a negative goal of governmental leadership? It's just service to the people, plain and simple. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and if it's biblical or not, I mean, you know, <laughs> Jesus Christ was the biggest servant. Mm -hmm. and, and look at the mighty power that he had. That's right. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm nobody. I'm just Addy. You know, you, it, yeah, I, I'm just here to serve you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Mike, the root cause of inflation in Florida and the country is the first question. Okay. Well, um, if you remember, uh, when our when Donald Trump was the president of the United States, gas was two bucks a gallon or less in Florida, and we didn't have the big inflation problem, right? So gas is much more than like three seventy five a gallon. Uh, I put premium gas in my car, so I pay four dollars a gallon for mm -hmm. gas. And uh, everything that comes to market has to be delivered by trucks, whether you get it at your doorstep or you pick it up at Walmart or wherever you're shopping. So I would suggest that energy cost is the number one thing that we can do in the state of Florida in order to reduce inflation, okay? So uh, the state of Florida is really at a pinnacle point right now. As pointed out by uh, Mitsubishi Energy, uh, past president of Mitsubishi Energy, Dave Walsh, that the state of Florida is determining which way to go right now, whether we uh, start rely on renewable energy, wind and solar, or uh, do we continue to uh, create energy with fossil fuels and nuclear. And Dave Walsh, who is an expert on the subject, says that uh, affordable, that renewable energy is, is, will raise your electric bill four times what it is right now, and it's not reliable. And you can take a look at the state of California and the state of Texas, who have both attempted to get onto renewables and it hasn't worked for either state. So I'm very concerned in the state of Florida that we would go in that direction uh, because the big utility companies, for various different reasons, are influencing uh, the governor's office and the legislature to become more reliant on renewable energy. So I'm saying to you that the cost of energy is the number one factor that's driving inflation in the state of Florida, and we have to remain on fossil fuels and nuclear until uh, renewables are ready for prime time, point number one. Okay. So next piece. Uh, the last one is a biblical world. Second one is what can be done to lower the Okay, cost. there you go. Okay. Uh, and a biblical worldview is critically important. I mean, uh, basically, um, you know, God created the universe, and all of the physics in the universe was created by God. And we have a choice of whether we want to walk in, in the way of the Lord, God, or do we want to swim upstream and resist, okay? So by studying our Bible, the Bible teaches us um, how to live in the creation that God created. So if we don't, and this is just my perspective, because I believe in Judeo-Christian values, I believe that the United States of America was founded on Judeo-Christian values. Judeo-Christian values are the reason that we became the successful nation that we were. And until we return to Judeo-Christian values as a culture in the United States of America, we will not solve the problems that we're facing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you.
You'll get it after a while. <laughs> At the end, we'll get yeah, it. Yeah, by one, we'll have you trained. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I just couldn't go to one, right? <laughs> well, we did give you I really didn't think this was going to go to one o'clock, but it might. And then Ralph showed up. <laughs> yeah. okay. What question do you have? All right, here's the question. Mm -hmm. Will you commit to absolutely do all you can legislatively to dismantle the North Lake Hospital District and its tax levying authority, which this year and potentially collect approximately $20 million from $200,000 in North Lake residents to provide unnecessary corporate welfare to two filthy, <laughs> rich hospitals. How do you really feel about that? Mercy. Okay. Well, I'll tell you something. Is that the question? Yeah, that is, that is the question. Long question, short answer. Yes. Okay. 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 Yeah, yeah, yes. 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 Okay. Uh, this will be a short answer for you too, I'm sure. Will you commit to absolutely do all you can legislatively to dismantle the North Lake Hospital District and its tax levying authority, which this year could potentially collect approximately twenty million dollars from the two hundred thousand North Lake residents provide to unnecessarily uh, provide unnecessary corporate welfare? To two filthy rich hospitals. <laughs> <laughs> Define <laughs> filthy. <laughs> I don't know. There's a there's a board member in the room, so I'm not sure how he feels about this. <laughs> but, Maybe uh, he wrote the question. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wrote the question. Short answer again, yes. But we also need to make sure that we have adequate indi indigent care. Um, you know, that, and, and we that's do, we and do. yeah, we have we have yeah. and we have to protect that. Yes. As long as we protect that, I'm good with it. Okay. Uh, let's see. You might as well stay here. Okay. Uh, growing house values result in constantly growing property taxes since electeds won't approve rollback rates. This causes fixed income homeowners to lose homes due to inability to pay higher taxes. What will you do to fix this problem? Increase the homestead. Okay. Increase the homestead on an annual basis. You know, we have we had twenty five thousand dollars per person for homestead exemption. Fifty thousand if you're a married couple. That should be double, if not triple. If the and it should we should fix it so that homestead increases by the property value amounts on an annualized basis. It's a simple solution. Mike, want to answer that question? Growing house values result in constantly growing property taxes and selected won't approve rollback rates. This causes fixed income homeowners to lose homes due to inability to pay higher taxes. What will you do to fix the problem? Well, number one, I will repeal the Live Local Act. <laughs> okay? Because again, let me just uh, let me just get your mind where my mind is. Okay? And with legislation, I mean, Tallahassee is about special interests. We've already pretty much established that. I think everybody in the room pretty much agrees that Tallahassee serves special interests, not the constituents, not the people that actually live here. And that's a big concern for me, okay? Be, um, because I, I personally am not as concerned about the people that want to move to the state of Florida as the people that live here now. Mm -hmm. And the families whose generations of uh, built the state of Florida contributed to the economic development of the state of Florida. But again, think about this for a second. The problem we have is, that the question is addressing is the price of housing. Well, when we subsidize housing purchases, the demand for housing goes up. Attic just got done telling us that we're several million or whatever it is, uh, number of housing units short in the state of Florida. So why would the legislature subsidize housing purchases in an undersupplied market, right? This drives the price of housing. And when you get over to the insurance question as well, um, when things become more expensive to build, when there's more demand for building materials, we have a labor shortage in the state of Florida, so labor is very expensive to build houses. Um, you know, we have this illegal immigration situation, which is definitely affects the housing industry. A lot of the home builders use illegal labor to build houses, stuff like that, right? You're driving the price of housing. So how does that affect, affect insurance? Well, insurance companies have real tangible losses from time to time. And when it becomes more expensive to build a house, then the cost of repairing damages when uh, natural disasters happen goes way up. So do, do we expect the insurance companies to just eat that? I mean. Do we not factor the cost of reconstruction into the equation? Of course we have to do that. So why are we subsidizing housing in an undersupplied market, driving the purchase price of housing, 
all at the same. And then, but again, another big piece of the puzzle. If Pew is right, and I would suggest that they're typically understate the number of illegals living in the state of Florida, not overstate. But let's assume they're right that there's 775,000 illegals. If you have an average household size of 2.5 people per household, which is typical in Florida, and I want to also let you know that let's assume that the household income in Florida, median household income, is $63,000. You know, um, it, is Florida really an affordable place to live? I mean, can a family with kids raise kids effectively in the $63,000 median household income in the state of Florida? I would suggest it isn't. Okay? So then you get into the whole uh, conversation about how do you make ends meet, you know, using credit card debt to finance grocery purchases and daily living expenses and things like that. Because I don't believe 63000 delivers uh, a decent quality of life um, when everybody, if on a pay-as-you-go basis in the state of Florida, it costs much more to live, you know, to provide for your family and your kids with housing, uh, again, the questions about housing prices, which are out of control, and yet we're subsidizing and spiking housing purchases, driving the price of housing. So that's a big problem. And we do need to deal with the 775,000 illegals because they are absorbing the housing supply. What about the 700,000 Haitians that are coming? Well, oh, exactly. Just exactly. They're going to shoot them in before they get to the shore. Um, this is about education. <laughs> what will you do to ensure the Lake County schools will be well funded, will let education dollars follow the student to private schools, and will not teach the woke, biased subjects? That's an interesting subject. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. No, nothing. I'm, okay. I'm ra waiting for you to start. So oh, okay. Start right. <laughs> okay. Yeah, well, you know. Um, um, our school board members have been telling us for decades that the appropriation of per student funding in the 67 counties in the state of Florida uh, underserves Lake County. And basically there's a formula where the, you know, basically the amount of funding per student is based on cost of living and things like that. So certainly the formula for funding in Florida needs to change. Um, I would suggest that the larger uh, counties and the uh, higher, uh, again, when the cost of living goes up in those particular counties, that means funding, per student funding in those counties goes up. And I, I just don't think that's an adequate, uh, uh, equitable way to appropriate school dollars, mm -hmm. uh, okay? And the whole Lake County School Board, I'm sure, agrees with that because they've been complaining to us about it for as long as I've been around, <laughs> which is like 2010, right? So uh, the appropriation formula for Lake County School, I mean, for the schools in the state of Florida has to change, point number one. And point number two, I think universal school choice is a great thing. Uh, on the other hand, um, to my knowledge, as I talk to public school teachers, they're telling me that the implementation of universal school choice um, is not adequately, um, is not adequately built out. Okay, so you, again, when you pass legislation, you have a law and then the various different committees uh, and organizations who administer the program write the rules for how the program is to be administered. So universal school choice, I think, is the answer. I think that's really where we're going with all of this. Um, I think families need to, make, uh, need to be empowered and put in control of the curriculum that our children um, are exposed to and are taught. Um, so I would suggest that, number one, the formula for appropriating funds to the counties is flawed and it certainly serves, uh, underserves rural counties. Um, I don't consider Lake County necessarily rural anymore, but we certainly are on the lower cost of living compared to some of the larger uh, counties. That's a problem. And I really think that universal school choice and uh, delving into universal school choice and the implementation of universal school choice is how we're going to solve the education problem in Florida. Thank you. Woke. Am I, can I sit down? Woke issues. The woke issues. Uh, well, um, you know, we really just, um, we need to, uh, we need to go back to teaching our kids reading, writing, arithmetic. Mm -hmm. And history. Uh, prayer in school. Mm -hmm. Of course, history, yeah. civics, yeah. right, yeah, exactly, you know. Yeah. So that's a huge problem, and um, we need to ban uh, any discussion of, uh, and I, I say ban, and of course, you know, that's a relative term. I mean, do you not have sex education in high schools anymore and things like that? So there obviously are some appropriate 
uh, applications for it, but uh, this, the public schools need to get back to teaching, reading, writing, arithmetic, and stay out of social issues. Let me close it by saying that. Thank you. All right. Eddie, hey, what will you do to ensure Lake County schools will be well funded, will let education dollars follow the students <coughs> to private schools, and will not teach woke bias subjects? <laughs> yeah, um, that's a pretty simple one. Let's just educate our children. Uh, universal school choice, I believe, in 100%. Uh, you know, the dollar should follow the student. No child should be trapped in an underperforming school because of where they live. A parent should have the right to take their child to any school in any district, private or otherwise, and take the dollars with them. Obviously, that comes with a lot of accountability that we need to have in place because, let's face it, there's, a kid, there's kids out there that the parents would take the dollars and use it on themselves and not their children. Mm -hmm. And so we've got to be able to put those measurements in place and those, those, those uh, bumpers, those guardrails in place, if you will, uh, to protect our kids from that behavior. Not all, of, not all parents are out there protecting their own children. Mm -hmm. They're just not. Um, that's why we have DCF. That's right. Uh, don't get started on that one. Yeah. Um, go ahead. Oh, okay. Was there, there was a two oh, part on there, yeah, wasn't there? there was two parts. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, will not teach the woke. Uh, what would you do to ensure that the woke biased subjects are not taught in the school? Teach the kids what they need. Do you know that US, USA Today is written to an eighth grade level? Eighth grade. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're graduating students right now that probably shouldn't graduate. Mm -hmm. And COVID has set back an entire generation yeah. of students. Mm -hmm. An entire generation. Yeah. They should be able to graduate high school and be able to balance a checkbook. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They should be able to, they should understand civics. And thank goodness we put some legislation in place that requires the teachers, the education systems to teach civics. Mm -hmm. Now they've got to teach, you know, about the ill effects of communism. Thank goodness. Mm -hmm. They need to understand what their freedoms look like. But we've got to get back down to teaching them the basics, fundamentals of life. You know, bring in, bring in the the trades back into the schools. Mm -hmm. Bring in yeah, home ec, all of those things. You know, mm -hmm. you, 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 you spend time on Instagram at all? On the reels? A little bit. A little bit. Mm -hmm. There's this beautiful new generation that are learning how to bake bread and needlepoint. I'm so excited for Gen Y because all of that disappeared for so long, and there's this renewed interest in being self-sustainable. Mm -hmm. And I love seeing it. So let's bring that back to the schools so we can nurture them. Absolutely. What about the funding? The funding side? Oh, oh, so we have formulas? We just don't use them here. They enforce the law. We actually have formulas, and they just don't use them. They don't use it for a lot of the different programs. How do they get away with that? Great question. Same way the they didn't use the formula. Yeah. Yeah. Don't follow yes. the law. Yes, and the formula Somebody gives the advantage job. to yeah. life right. work. Mm -hmm. That's right. Ah, uh, okay. Right. So it's a biased. Formula. Well, that, and yeah, we're not we're not holding our developers accountable for making sure that you know, there's a school within <clears throat> like large developments. I'm not talking about you know 100 homes. That's that's a different issue. But mm -hmm. when we have mass developments like Stony Brook, Stony Brook's a big one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And where what school is? Servicing that development. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, you can stand for this okay. one. <laughs> do you or do you not support the 13% tax increases like the Eustace candidate who did not appear today? Oh, jeez. <laughs> 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 question wow. is that? Well, there you go. That we can never win that one. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I don't support the 13% tax increase. They ought to cut their budget. Um, I've seen what they spend money on, and it's not the vision of the future. Okay. Mike, do you or do you not support the 13% uh, increase? Okay. What is this increase? Can you explain what that is? What they're talking about? Right. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm just I, I'm, uh, speculating that the question is about the city of Eustis, a budgetary issue in the city of Eustis. This is the first time really uh, okay. hearing about it. Yeah, but uh, you, you, I would like to take this opportunity on that subject uh, to talk about taxation, right? Okay. Because taxes never go down, right? No. Taxes no. never go down. No. Um, we, we, in a business, we, uh, I've always run my business with a zero-based budgeting formula, right? We don't think about what we spent last year. We think about what we're going to need in the upcoming budget cycle, and we only budget for the things that we need, okay? So that's just not the way government works at all. I, I'm sure you can't find a government agency in the entire state of Florida that wipes the slate clean and starts over 
But uh, I, I would love to talk more on this issue, but we only have a couple of minutes. So if you want to, t if you want to hear some really interesting stuff, talk to me later, right? But uh, certainly, uh, you know, every single governmental budget has a lot of garbage in it. So the idea that we're going to raise 13% taxes without visiting some of the spending that we have going on in our budgets right now is absolutely ludicrous. And this is an insult. This, this, honestly, truly, one of the reasons I'm running, right, is because it's just an absolute slap in the face to taxpayers, right? I mean, honestly and truly, everything we've talked about today, or many of the things we've talked about today, is where some people pay all the bills and everybody else is a recipient, right? Mm -hmm. So, again, you're, you know, subsidizing housing purchases for people who don't have a down payment. Okay, in some situations, it's not a bad idea. In this situation, it is a bad idea. Housing is already overpriced, right? And that the same taxpayer who's funding that down payment assistance is also building affordable housing complexes for illegals living in our state. Mm -hmm. Okay, so step one, get rid of the illegals. Yeah. Right. Right? And then so the 13% in tax increase in Eustace, absurd. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I'll tell you, I hope that these city councils um, realize that we can't just continue to add program after program after program without reducing programs that are no longer effective. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Want me to stay for another question? Yeah, stay for another question. I'm starting to get it. Slow learners. Repetition. The state of Florida incarcerates more citizens than any state. Prisons are grossly overpopulated. 65% are there because of the non prescription drug use. How do you feel about decriminalizing medicines without prescription and regulating opiates, etc., the way cannabis has yeah. been successfully in Florida? Well, that's a really complicated question. Um, so, you know, that is, uh, so basically, um, the way. Uh, rather than get into, because um, rather than get into, you know, which drug should be legal, which drug should not be legal, what's the penalty for this, what's the penalty for that, okay? Um, I believe that when you follow the money, you always get to the root of the problem, okay? And when government is outsourcing the management of our prisons, and the companies that are running the prisons are paid based on occupancy, then there's a motivation to arrest people and put people in jail. Right? So I'm against that. Okay? I'm against any incentive that a law enforcement officer would have to write speeding tickets or arrest people to a quota or anything like that. I mean, that... Honestly, if you want to get into, uh, to, to, one thing I've always said since I've, you know, been involved in politics, which has been pretty much my whole adult life, right, um, is, and, and I'm just saying to you, this is that everything we see at the national level, anything you see at the national level, please understand that it's happening at the local level too, okay? So when a law enforcement officer is incentivized to write tickets, make arrests, when people are incentivized to keep people in jail instead of getting people out of jail, that is a financial, financially driven situation, and we just can't have that. This is an example of weaponization of government locally, okay? And um, we certainly don't want people spending uh, decades in jail over victimless crimes, okay? I would suggest that. But again, I also want to be very clear that criminals have to be punished. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, prison is punishment. Okay? So, what well, we want to be very careful that um, s sentencing, mandatory sentencing, is matches the crime and the risk. Again, why do you put people in jail? We put people in jail because we determine they're a risk to society. But people that are not a risk to society should not be in jail. Okay? And I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Can I sit down there? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes, you can. Okay, Annie, I'll read it again. Florida uh, incarcerates more citizens than any state. Prisons are grossly overpopulated. 65% are there because of non prescription drug use. How do you feel about decriminalizing medicine without prescriptions and regulating opiates, et cetera, the way cannabis has been successfully in Florida? So the, the, the question is, how do I feel about uh, decriminalizing 
opiates. Mm -hmm. That's what it, that's what I hear it as. And if we want to look like Portland, if we want to look like Seattle, mm -hmm. decriminalize opiates. Mm -hmm. um, yes. The drug addiction is a major problem, yeah. and it's because of self worth issues that we have as a society. Um, so how do I feel yeah. about decriminalizing it? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Those are the types of things that the government should help protect our families from. Addiction is an absolutely terrible disease and it will destroy people. As far as incarceration is concerned, the goal of incarceration is rehabilitation. So if we're going to be... That's not happening in the prisons. And that's the problem. Yeah, the, but it, it, so as a company, I have a mission, right? I know what my mission statement is and all of our actions support that. Yes, we've got to get dangerous people off the streets, and there are going to be people that are not rehabilitatable, mm -hmm. right? They're either unwilling or they are just ugly humans that are, are they do not belong on the streets. But those that can be rehabilitated, those that have the desire to be rehabilitated, we should spend efforts and time and force the prisons to enact programs. Now, let's just think about some programs that we could enact in a, in a prison to help them rehabilitate. Education programs, job opportunities. What about a call center in prison to actually let them earn a wage? Because the problem is some of these these crimes, and, and there are victimless, victimless crimes, and they should not be incarcerated because of that. It's typically somebody that is supposed to be paying child support. Mm -hmm. And now you've decimated an entire family because he's in prison or she's in prison, and the children are not being supported. Mm -hmm. So why not put employment centers in the prison so they can earn a decent wage and send money back to their families and rehabilitate at the same time. The problem with the incarceration is that we're not holding the prison owners and their owners and the managers accountable for helping to rehabilitate their repeat offenders. They're just getting new overnight guests. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, you just stay here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we only move one foot. Yeah. <laughs> Um, many Florida agencies calculate or share performance metrics on operation efficiency, unlike my businesses. <laughs> Will you commit to actively seeking legislation to mandate all government agencies to calculate standardized public performance metrics that can be compared to others like cost per household, maintenance costs, etc.? Absolutely. I've, I've worked for several not-for-profit organizations, and I've seen I've seen how wasteful spending happens. You know, oh, we spent this much this year, and we've we've grown by this amount of members. We should increase our budget because, and that's how they justify it. And they just keep increasing the budget, increasing the budget, and then they go throw big parties, and yeah, you know, it's it, it's silly. You got to reinvest it back in the people. So part of it, when I was the president of the Realtors Association of Lake and Central Counties, we never did profit and losses for events that we would hold, or classes that we would hold. Everything that we did was just, well, we spent this much last year, we need to spend this much next year. No, every event needs a profit and loss statement. We need to show that there's a tangible return on the dollars that we spent. Mm -hmm. Same thing in government. Every single system that we have, every, everything that's housed within a department should have a profit and loss statement. You've got to be able to show the return. Now, there are going to be departments where it is a spending. It, you know, it, there, there's not going to be a tangible return on those dollars. DCF is a big one, right? And it's one of those underfunded agencies. Mm -hmm. But we've got to be able to measure the mm -hmm. amount of money that we're spending and what are we seeing back in return. Mm -hmm. what, are, what are those measurables? Mm -hmm. It might not be a, a, a dollar amount. It might be a quality of life. It might be, you know, lack of repeat offenders, those sorts of things, you know, at the human side of it. How do you measure the human side? Mm -hmm. Can I go now? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I go now. <laughs> it's like we're beating them up. Our <laughs> <laughs> is a suffering over yet. <laughs> I'll read it down. Many four agencies calculate or share performance metrics on operational efficiency, unlike most businesses. Will you commit to actively seeking legislation to mandate all government? agencies to calculate standardized public performance metrics that can be compared to others like cost per household, maintenance costs, etc. Um, absolutely. Uh, although I think that while that's a great step in the right direction, 
it doesn't solve the whole problem. When you have inefficient government agencies comparing themselves to other inefficient government agencies, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, what I mean? it gets a little kooky, right? Because I'm a zero-based budgeter. I mean, that's just the way I would do everything. And uh, uh, you know, I think Addie made a, some good points, right? I mean, when you this is another reason why we need to send business people to government, right? Mm. Uh, by moving people from one government agency to another and uh, letting them working inside of government their whole right. life climb the government ladder, they only know one thing, and that's just a, and again, this is how taxes just, this is, this, this is how taxes go up constantly, because nothing ever goes away. No government programs ever go away. We just add new ones and tax people more, and the government doesn't feel it because they have a license to take your money. Right? These are taxing authorities. This is a <coughs> fundamental premise. When you start looking at anything, you have to say, is this a taxing authority? Because these people have the legal right to take your money. Mm -hmm. right? right? Exactly. And there's no incentive for them to downsize, and most of them have never lived in an environment where profitability was important, where efficiency was important, right? So uh, I would definitely support it, but I'd like to go a lot farther. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 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 Um, list three, election integrity reforms needed. Well, goes uh, on, but sure. uh, let's just do that. That's <laughs> so, okay, well, you know, since, uh, since I launched my campaign, election integrity has been a big piece of the puzzle, right? And it's so interesting that all of the supervisory elections in the state of Florida agree that they all outsource the management of their voter rolls to a private, the same private sector company. There's no argument about that. The, and I've stood with Alan Hayes. And we talked about it. He said, yes, we do, in fact, do that. And I said, oh, that's great. We, at least we understand what, what's going on here. The difference is you think it's a good idea, and I don't. <laughs> right? I think when you hire a supervisor of elections, you elect a supervisor of elections. It's their job to manage the voter rolls in their own county. Right? So number one, ban the outsourcing of voter rolls. Okay? The second thing that happens is while some private sector company has access to our voter rolls, we're also outsourcing the printing of the ballots. Right? So just out of curiosity, is there an opportunity for the printer and the database manager to collude? Absolutely. How important is your vote? Right? I would suggest that I would rather have the sanctity of my vote than money. Mm -hmm. This is what our great nation is built on, one man, one vote. And that is not what's happening here. So you have outsource. Well, again, I did get a call from a gentleman who printed the ballots for Emma Jean Stiegel for 50 years. And him and I went back and forth on this particular issue, and we agreed. I would be satisfied if every single supervisor of elections hired a printer in the county to print the ballots, okay? Mm -hmm. But, and that the printer should only be able to work for one supervisor. That way, 67 supervisors of elections are printing ballots in their county by a local printer mm -hmm. who becomes the conscience of the community as it relates to ballot printing, okay? So I, uh, my platform says ban the outsourcing of the printing of the ballots, but I have a little compromise that I just defined for you. The third thing is the mailing of the ballots. So um, the, when the supervisor of elections outsources the printing of the ballots, the printers mail the ballots. The printers mail the ballots. This is not arguable or contested. All the supervisors agree that they outsource the management of the voter rolls, they outsource the printing of the ballots, they outsource the mailing of the ballots. So this is just out of control. I mean, what do we pay these people for, right? Exactly. So, I mean, those are just three examples. Okay. Yeah, I've been, those are it's good. been in my platform since day one. Quick okay. question. Yes. Does every state outsource? Absolutely. Yeah, and it's so interesting. Right? Now, outsources. let me explain that to you, right? Mm -hmm. Because VR Systems manages the voter rolls for the state of Florida. Mm -hmm. Okay? And, and in Florida, we have, there's three printing companies that print all the ballots for the entire state of Florida, and the big one prints 75% of all the ballots, and the other ballots are split between these other two relatively smaller companies, right? But they all do it, okay? And VR Systems, the company that manages the voter rolls for Florida, manages the voter rolls for four other states, and every state in America has a VR Systems. So let me explain this in another question. Afterwards. Okay, Annie, I'll, I'll read the question again. Uh, list three, election integrity reforms. Number one is serial numbers, which we talked about earlier, so I won't expand on that too much, but serial numbers on every single ballot. What? The problem Water. with the, pro the problem with election integrity is lack of oversight. So whether you take all of the ballot printing into your local area, and I've seen enough corruption in local areas and good old boy systems to 
manipulate outcomes that I don't necessarily think that's the solution. No matter what the solution is, it's oversight, 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 and oversight. VR system is, is a public, is a, sorry, a private organization or private company. I'm not sure how I feel about that, managing the entire uh, election or voter roll system without adequate oversight. So who's watching the hen house? Is it the government guarding the hen house? Because I don't necessarily trust the government either. We've seen what the federal government does. And if they were in charge of elections, guess what would happen? We would never change parties. We would be a communist country. So what does the oversight look like? I would enact legislation that requires oversight, not just one body, but multiple bodies, so that way things can be reviewed, managed, and everything's transparent. Everything's got to be transparency. Trust builds, trans or transparency builds trust, and I think that we have an inadequate amount of transparency in the as far as elections are concerned, and the fact that most people don't know that our ballots are not even printed by our government. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They have no idea. A majority of people don't know. You guys are all very, very attuned to what's going on in your community, what's going on in your elections. I would say 90% of people are not. They think that we're a bunch of conspiracy theorists. So uh, item number two would be oversight. And item number three, um, I would shut down that early voting window. And, you know, we've got an election day. It, there should be no ballots voted or accounted after election day, period, across the board. Um, unless it's a military, military ballots, they should be sent out in adequate enough time to be counted before election day happens. So, those are my three Thank things. you. Can I sit? Yes, okay. you can sit. <laughs> I have another question. Oh. Wow. Unless anybody didn't turn one in. Nope. Got them all? Okay. Final statement? You're, you're, yes, sure. Give a final statement. <laughs> go ahead, Mike. I'd like Andy go first. Can, can I ask a question? Go ahead. I, didn't, I didn't Afterwards, wait. afterwards, afterwards okay. we can ask at the candidates okay. any questions. Yeah. When you look at everything that we're dealing with, Okay, the problem we have in America and the problem we have in the state of Florida is that the people that live here are just not included in the equation at all. Mm -hmm. uh, you can get into it. Uh, we talked a lot about uh, the density of population in our counties and our state. Um, the state legislature is completely um, not concerned about what people in our county want, right? I think we should have a voice in the culture of our county a long time ago um, when the Lake County was looking for a slogan for the uh, Tourism Council uh, they came up with Real Florida Real Close. My suggestion was um, Lake County is the outdoor living capital of Florida, the home of the one acre lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Remember that? Yeah. And it was so funny because Gary Borders used to always say that. He said, Mike, you know, I like your uh, slogan as long as I get my money. Right? <laughs> That's exactly Every time Gary Porter saw me and told me the same thing, love that slogan, as long as I get the money I need to protect this county. And by the way, I'm all about making sure that law enforcement has all the money they need to protect the county. But <laughs> citizens' voices must be heard. Legislation should come out of the grassroots, not top down. It needs to be bottom up, not top down. And when I go to Tallahassee, on your behalf, it is your voice that I will take to Tallahassee. We will have town hall after town hall after town hall. I'll continue to come to the Republican Executive Committee meetings. Um, I'll continue to be more and more involved than I've ever been. And many of you have had enough of me already. <laughs> you know what I mean? But, uh, you know, uh, it's just so critical that government serves the people and the people's voices are heard. And we can have uh, meetings like this. Um, with an open back and forth dialogue so that we learn from each other and uh, collaboration is the way that things get better. And I'm, I just see it. I mean, I've lobbied the government for a long time. And uh, I don't hear, uh, I, just, I just don't see what's happening in government. Government serves the administrative state and serves special interests. And I think it's time that we have a populist, nationalist platform. Uh, and we can start that in the state of Florida. And once we get it initiated, and it, ta it takes... It takes fortitude to drive this. They're not, it's just like the administrative state is not going to turn the keys to the kingdom over. They're not. We're going to have to earn it, fight for it, win it. Okay? And that's the reason I stepped up to run. I've been doing this a long time. I don't see too many people who have had the guts to stand up to the Republican Party of Florida like I have. Okay? And look, I was with the Realtor Association and their public policy committee, and I always brought my point of view to that. 
okay? And the idea that some special interest is going to walk into my office and I'm going to give them carte blanche everything they want, that's just not going to happen with Mike Libby, and I think you all know that. Those of you who know me, that's, that's not going to happen. Not unreasonable. We want great things. We want things that are getting... Like, for example, just in closing, right? We target the bot Everything that we do is targeted toward the least. Mm. When in reality, wealth creation happens at the top. Right? We have to have we have to put a model forward that inspires people to do better, not enable them to do less. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So I want to clarify something about the Live Local Act. Um, how many of you think that builders build affordable housing? That's right. They don't. They don't build affordable housing. That's the problem. They can't afford to. There's no profit for them. The oh Live Local God. Act forces them to set aside a certain percentage of their development to affordable housing. That's the difference. We need housing. We are short 1.5 million units in, the, in, in Florida alone. So if you live in a two-story house right now and you fall tomorrow and your bedroom's upstairs and you have to sell your house to go into a one-story, Try finding a house right now. Even in this, if, if, even with the interest rates high, it's almost impossible to find what you need and have it be affordable. Supply helps that. It's all supply and demand. You can't say I'm against the uh, Live Local Act, and I also don't want to subsidize housing. When we need housing to balance out those prices a little bit, it's if if you go to the grocery store and there's only one loaf of bread, and the and the shopkeeper gets to determine the price of the bread. Mm -hmm. What are they going to do? They're going to raise the price. We need more bread on the shelves. Simple. But we've got to do it in a way that, that, number one, honors the environment. We cannot deplete our natural resources. And schools, public safety, and health care is considered in all of that. We have to have more houses because we have the people. Florida is a great place to live and work. It's a beautiful place to live and work, and my mission is to keep it that way. I grew up in Southern California. I do not want to see Florida become Southern California. It's an absolute nightmare. It is so depressing to watch what's happened there, and it takes vigilant people to go up there in Tallahassee and fight for you and fight for the people of North Lake County. I want to keep North Lake County looking like North Lake County, but we've got to do it in a way that allows for new people to come in, or we're all going to die off. That's happening too, <laughs> right? We only have so many days left on this earth. But I'm going to go up there. I'm going to fight for you. I'm going to fight for North Lake County because that's what I care about: the state and North Lake County. 